Hi there and thanks for watching. Today I'm looking at one of the most horrific stories in the Bible, the story of Sodom in Genesis chapter 20. It's a story that uh, has been hugely controversial over the years because it's been misapplied, as we will see shortly. The story is of a city against whom there is a huge moral outcry and outrage that's come to the very ears of heaven. And God has sent two angels to investigate and potentially to bring judgment. And they arrive at Sodom in the evening. And it's Abraham's nephew Lot who is at the gate of the city and meets them. And it's Lot, not a native of the city, but an immigrant who offers them a room and a meal in his house. The men had intended to sleep in the city square. But in verse 3 of Genesis 20, it says that Lot insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. And while they were there, one of the most shocking incidents in the Bible occurs. In verse 4, before they'd gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friend, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who've never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they've come under the protection of my roof. Get out of our way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. And they kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men reached inside. The men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness, so that they couldn't find the door. For years, of everyone's made a big thing about the homosexual or maybe bisexual nature of the behaviour of these guys. But if you look even just below the surface, it should be obvious to anyone with a vestige of decency that that at most is a side issue. It's hardly even worth mentioning compared with what's going on here. We have a gang of men, not uh, an isolated group, but from all over the city, prowling the streets at night, planning the violent gang rape and probably the murder of two visitors who culturally, morally and legally were entitled to their protection. That is why you went into a city at night was for protection and safety. And Lot's proposed solution is to offer them his own daughters, who were both virgins and both pledged in marriage to two other men. This is just so wrong by any standard, and yet he must have been so desperate. He's done the right thing, but now he's totally up against it. He's invited these men in and given them hospitality, and now he's under this awful pressure. And frankly, the gender of the victims and of the perpetrators is completely irrelevant to the moral questions of this story. Almost nowhere in the history of the world would any of this have been considered generally acceptable. Not only law and order has broken down, but common decency and humanity and the cultural norms of the day have completely broken down inside this city. And this is not an isolated incident. Lot's determination to get the men behind the locked door of his home speaks volumes. He knew the city square at night was not a safe place for those men. He was expecting something like this. Stuff like this has happened before. This is in the nature of the city. No wonder there is moral outrage at what's going on inside the walls. In the Middle East generally, and particularly among nomadic tribes, there is and always has been a strong culture of hospitality. It was a point of honour to offer hospitality to the stranger. In Sodom, not only has that gone out of the window, but it's reversed into a culture of abuse and exploitation in the most horrific ways. 
Hospitality is a New Testament value as well. Most church activity in the New Testament took place in the home. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, the writer says, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. And you wonder whether the writer had this story in mind when he said that. Now, I've got to admit, I'm a bit rubbish at hospitality generally. And in lockdown, of course, it's really hard. <clears throat> but you can still keep in touch with people. You can meet out of doors one to one. The company I work for is just in the coming week is paying for everyone to have a takeaway at home. And we're going to have a, a go to meeting and a social event online and, and share a meal that way, which is brilliant. So there are creative ways that we can get around this. It is possible to be hospitable. And today as a nation, we also have a responsibility, a legal responsibility, to provide hospitality to those who arrive here as refugees or seeking asylum. According to the UN High Commission for Refugees, at the end of 2018, there were 126,720 people living in this country as refugees, over 45,000 pending asylum cases and 125 stateless persons. That might sound a lot, but compared with the top 10 hosting nations, it's nothing. Eight of the top 10 refugee hosting nations have more than a million refugees living within their boundaries. And the only leading economy in that top 10 is Germany with around 1.1 million. The number one nation, Turkey, has 3.6 million refugees living within its borders. Admittedly, most of those will be in camps <coughs> and the UN High Commission will be taking a lot of responsibility for that. So why, why do we have this responsibility? Well, apart from being signed up to international agreements, let you give, me give you four reasons why we have a moral responsibility as a country. Firstly, our meddling contributed to the breakdown of nations like Libya and Syria, where so many refugees are coming from or passing through. Secondly, as the colonial power, we created artificial boundaries that exacerbated tribal tensions in what are now conflict areas. Thirdly, as the colonial power, we strip resources and impoverished many of those regions. We grew rich either by just taking what we wanted or by paying far less than the true value of the resources that we took. And then fourthly, Today, the West drains nations of their ablest, their most skilled and their best educated people. Simon Reeve, in his great little autobiography, Step by Step, he wrote that the International Organisation on Migration has concluded that there are more Ethiopian doctors working in Chicago than in the whole of Ethiopia. One study found that an astonishing 77% of physicians trained in Liberia were actually working in the US. And our own health service is propped up by skilled workers, the cost of whose training was borne by some of the poorest countries. And we depend and rely on them. And by taking their skills and taking their knowledge, we contribute to poor governments, and uh, you know, poor social structures in some of the countries that so many are trying to escape from. And then there's our own homeless on the streets. What can we do for them? I, I always intend to stop and talk, but somehow I always seem to meet homeless people when I'm on a deadline and, and in a hurry, and it's easy just to walk by and, and ignore them. But we can stop and talk. We can you know, give them a drink. We can contribute to homeless charities. There is so much that we can do as individuals as well as as a nation. <clears throat> Meanwhile, back in Sodom, the two angels strike the men blind physically. Frankly, they're blind already. Their moral compass is completely out of skew. They've become like animals in their behaviour and in their outlook. 
And even if they hadn't intended such horrible abuse, just by leaving those men out in the cold, they betrayed their own culture and humanity. Lot, on the other hand, invites the men into his own home. He provides food, shelter, drink and protection. And in so doing, he demonstrates the love of God. God who has taken that role towards Lot and Abraham as provider and protector. What a wonderful example that he set in that initial act of hospitality. So my ending prayer today is for those who are refugees, those who are outside, those who are in the cold, those who are homeless, those who are lonely and isolated, and for us. May God help us to find creative and useful ways to reach out, to acknowledge them, to interact with them and to somehow to begin to provide for the needs that they so have. So God, give us wisdom, give us grace, give us courage and determination, and Father, help us not to shy away from our own responsibility. Amen.